And um, and I would love it if you guys could, if you could just tell the people in the Hangout a little bit about your story. We, we did push your bio in the um, sure. event page, but I think people would love to hear it from your own mouth. Um, maybe sure. how, you, how you got into sure. this business. Well, first off, thanks so much for having me. It's fun to, um, to be the kickoff person for your, your online community here. This is great. Um, so I actually started the Great Sea Company a little over 12 years ago, and it was a hobby that turned into a lot more. Um, I was a teacher at the time. I was a special ed teacher in Santa Barbara, and um, I had moved from the East Coast, and... The East Coast is a bit more progressive with special education than other parts of the country. And uh, I moved to California and found out California was very backwards. I was the only special ed teacher in a kindergarten through sixth school. I was responsible for um, the entire caseload of special ed in that population. And then I was just managing a lot of, a lot of aides and assistants that were, um, you know, I, I actually realized that whole background has helped me a lot in my business because I learned how to, I learned how to manage people very early on without really, without really knowing, how, knowing I was doing that. Um, and one of the toughest things about growing a business is bringing more people in and I'll get into the culture part to help you more fun. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I started so, um, I the started idea for this business this when business I actually finished um, my master's degree in Boston, degree in, Boston, Boston in, in inner city Boston, Boston school, Boston. decided to quit my job, to quit my job and sail down to the Caribbean on a 30 foot sailboat with um, a boyfriend who I ended up marrying. <laughs> so, um, we left and uh, just set off on this big adventure on this very, very small boat and had to basically problem solve every day to figure out how we were going to the next place and to get to hopefully our final destination of the Caribbean. Um, along the way, we stopped in some really interesting spots and also some really remote spots. And you know, we couldn't get to regular stores. I couldn't go to CVS and buy soap or shampoo or things like that. So I actually um, got some books in a book exchange. There's a lot of times when you stop at marinas, there, there are other people that will leave books and you can leave books and just trade stuff. So I picked up some books on like essential oils and making skincare products. And I started making products on this teeny tiny little boat. Like the kitchen is seriously, maybe, Oh, gosh, I don't know. It's uh, the size of a very small coat closet. <laughs> so I started making products just for us to use because we couldn't get to stores to, to buy them. And um, as we got down into the Caribbean, there were all these cool local ingredients that I could start using, like mangoes and coconuts and things like that. So I was basically just using what I could buy at the farmer's markets or what people were selling on the street or, you know, sometimes... Even places in the Bahamas, you know, we all think of like Nassau and all the resorts and stuff there. That's only one island. There's 500 islands in the Bahamas. And some of them literally only get food beyond fish and what they can grow on the island if a mailboat comes in and delivers it. If the weather's rough, the mailboats don't come. So basically people learn to live with what they have. And, you know, so different seasons I'd get like yucca and different, you know, things I had never eaten, let alone try to make product with, but I just started making products and I absolutely loved it. And when I was doing my like night shift sailing, I'd, I'd study essential oils and herbs and get my hands on as many books and things as I could. Um, this was like early 2000s. So it was before internet, you know, you could get internet out on boats. Now you can do like satellite stuff and actually get it out there. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I just did a lot of self-research and um, really fell in love with doing this. And eventually uh, we, we had to come back to the real world and we ended up moving to Puerto Rico, selling our boat and then flying back to the United States. And um, we had said to each other, okay, if we're gonna move back, let's think of top three places we wanna go. We wanna go. First place that both of us agreed on out of the three was Santa Barbara. So um, 
we literally flew back to Boston, packed a U-Haul and drove cross country to Santa Barbara and didn't have jobs or anything, just we're gonna make it work. So, <laughs> um, so Pete, my, my now ex-husband, but uh, he at the time, I, I wasn't really worried about getting a job because I had a pretty specific degree that um, in inclusion, which is bringing special ed into a regular classroom. And there were only five schools in the United States that were actually giving that degree at the time I got it. So I pretty much knew I could go anywhere and they'd hire me. Um, so I got a job right away teaching special education in Goleta, California, which is where UCSB is. And um, Pete, my ex-husband, got a job doing bike tours up in wine country. So he was going up to wine country, leading people to wineries every day and biking in between. And it happened to be the fall harvest season. And during harvest season, they're picking the grapes, they're crushing the grapes, and then they're disposing of all the grape seeds. So, you know, he came back and he said, hey, you know, this, there's like these mounds, like mountains of grape seeds, like red wine, just chunks and seeds. Could you make anything with those? And I started researching about grape seeds and the health benefits and found out they were really amazing and high in resveratrol, resveratrol. which is really good for your heart and your skin and all sorts of great medical benefits that um, have been studied and proven by doctors. And so I started just experimenting with grape seeds in the formula. And Pete's old college roommate came to visit us over Christmas or New Year's that year. And his wife was doing... Um, finishing her business degree and doing a lot of graphic design work. And she said, hey, can I have my, um, I had started selling at like a beach market, you know, making three different products and selling at a beach market and like doing my own labels, total, like just very crafty looking, you know? And um, she said, hey, can I make this my final project for my degree? I wanna design your logo and do your whole branding. And so she came up with the concept of our logo, which was the G with the grapes. And um, from there, I went into my boss and I said, hey, you know, I'm gonna start this business, but you know, Santa Barbara is a really expensive place to live. Would you consider letting me work part-time? And so I, um, over five years, no, actually over four years, I first went 80% at my job. So I was working Monday through Thursday and then I had Fridays off. The next year I took two days off. And then the next year I took three days off and then did a job share and then fully was able to financially support myself and left teaching altogether. But I had absolutely no investors. I had no friends and family funding, nothing, which for a product-based business is pretty much unheard of. Like I, at first I was really embarrassed by it and I wouldn't tell people that I was like totally just bootstrapping beyond belief to make this all happen. And you know, it, for, for my ex-husband and I, it, it meant cutting a lot out of our lifestyle and you know, we both made sacrifices to make it, make it work. But eventually it, it turned into a real legitimate business that not only supports me, but also we have, um, depending depending on how many contract employees we're working with we have at any given time between seven and 15 employees that we're also supporting and providing jobs in the community and santa barbara's not an easy place to find a job either so it's um it's just been a wild ride for 12 years but a pretty amazing experience and taught me more than i mean every, every day i'm learning something new it's it's pretty awesome <laughs> Most of the well, time. And that is, it's such an amazing story to me. And it's so funny. It seems like so many women um, end up into entrepreneurship accidentally. You know, like it wasn't something you set out to do. You were just making these products for yourself on the boat. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, oh, there's my face. I don't want to see my face. <laughs> I want to see Kristen's face. <laughs> but I... Um, I, I love your story because, um, because I think it is the way a lot of women get into business um, is they didn't set out to do it, but they came up with a really interesting product or they solved a problem for themselves. Mm -hmm. And by doing that ended up, you know, having something that, that really worked and then having to learn how to build the business and really become, you know, a true CEO in the process. So, um, so I know that everybody would love to hear more about how you did 
did this, how you bootstrapped. And that was something that we have been wanting to hear from you for a while. And I know you kind of went over it a little bit then, but um, I mean, it sounds like the key was that you had a job and you built this business slowly over time, but you, you, um, you didn't just jump in and quit your job and, and um, create a lot of financial stress for yourself. Is, is that, um, was that your plan or, or was it just because you already were working as a teacher and so it sort of evolved from there? And what would you recommend others to do if they're launching something similar to what, what you did? I think it depends on your threshold for, you know, stability <laughs> and, and your financial threshold. Let's put it that way. I, it's, it's what, you know, I knew, I knew for us, we had to, we had to cover rent. And then during that process, bought a house, had to cover a mortgage. I knew we had to do that. And I did some really creative things with the business, actually renting space uh, when we purchased our house from us basically <laughs> so that um so that we could afford a bigger house to get into a bigger house and that i could have the business in the house and i actually when we moved i had the business in the house for nine months before we moved out um i've had some really lucky things happen around along the way and also not so lucky because when i look at it i think oh wait that was really lucky but it really comes down to it was my network. It was people around me that put me in contact with the right people and got me deals that, you know, I probably couldn't have afforded for moving the business out of the home. So um, there's, <laughs> that's, that's a really tricky question to answer because I, it depends on what, what you're going to be comfortable with and what your family's going to be comfortable with. And I feel like we took a good amount of risk, but then sometimes when I talk to other entrepreneurs, I'm realizing like, oh, okay, you know, it wasn't like we were borrowing thousands or millions even from people or, or banks or anything like that. Like we were just taking the risk on our own and then taking the risk of reinvesting the money that we made back into the business, which I did for years. I didn't draw a salary for the first five years of the business. So, um, you know, it really, it really depends on what your what your threshold is. And also I think it's different between product and consulting based businesses because consulting based businesses, you are the product. You can start making money right away. Whereas product based businesses, you're gonna have to invest in inventory or for me, we're a handmade local business. So I have to invest in the staff to actually make it on top of that and the raw ingredients and all the components and sourcing and things like that. So, um, you know, it's, it's a it's a tricky thing to do, but it, it really I think all of us as entrepreneurs are a little risky to begin with. That's part of our makeup. That's why we do what we do. We do what we love and and the risk is worth it for us. So it's it's kind of figuring out what you're comfortable with and then making a plan from there and then just making sure your partner's comfortable with it, too, because I think, you know, entrepreneurs do have a really high rate of divorce. I wouldn't say that was the number one reason that my marriage fell apart, but it definitely contributed it's stressful if you aren't an entrepreneur and you don't think like that, probably being a partner with one. So, you know, just making sure that your family's on board with what you're doing and the decisions that you're making is along the way. Oh, I lost Jessica. Can you guys hear her? Uh -oh. Can you okay, guys hear me? <laughs> okay. Um, Lisa's being my, my pilot here. She's managing all the controls. You're doing a great job, by the way, Lisa. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> I wish I could hear you. Uh, you look really great. I like your scarf. <laughs> Anyways, um, so I have a question. And, and as people have questions, um, please post them in the chat. Um, and so Kristen can start to answer them. But I, one of the questions I think a lot of people with product-based businesses would have, especially when they're first starting out, is how did you grow your client base, your customer base? Mm -hmm. How did you, you, you know, you were saying you were going to, you know, like farmer's market kind of things, um, yeah. or however you worded that. Is that, how did your, how did your customer base grow initially? How did you find customers and how did you grow that, that base? Well, I think we went out and we went out and and that was yeah, the that was the to things growing. Sorry, I'm getting a little feedback. I'm going to see if I can turn down my volume a little. Um, 
So we started off by doing the, the beach show in Santa Barbara, which every Sunday there's a bunch of artists and crafts makers that set up along the beach walk and people just go for a stroll and shop. And it's really just fun, cool event that's every single Sunday. And um, you have to get juried and approved in to be a beach vendor. So that I had a friend who was a glass blower and a few other friends in town that were selling some pretty cool things. And I'm like, hey, cool, I can go down and hang out with those guys and we'll just be at the beach selling our stuff, making, <laughs> making a little money on the weekend, see what happens. And so um, I got in, started doing that. And six months into that, Santa Barbara is um, about an hour and a half from Los Angeles, if you don't hit traffic, which yeah, it's really bad lately. But <laughs> um, a lot of people take weekend trips from LA to Santa Barbara. So I was getting a lot of spa owners from Los Angeles coming up and finding us at the beach show and thinking our whole concept was so amazing. Because what we do is we actually work with local winemakers to source their wine waste. So we take their red wine waste. We go through processing the seeds. We do everything in-house um, down at our, our production kitchen, which is behind our store. And we have a warehouse in downtown Santa Barbara. And um, we turn this grapeseed waste into over a hundred different skincare products for the whole family. So we have everything from a baby care line to a men's line to a hair line to our, our best selling line is our facial skincare line because grape seeds are known to help as a natural anti-aging ingredient. So, um, you know, I was getting these spa owners that were coming up, loving the concept, thinking it was so cool and saying, hey, do you sell wholesale? Hey, do you sell back bar? Which means do you sell by the gallon or half gallon so we can use it in treatments? And so I just started saying yes to everything. I, mean, <laughs> I felt like I felt like the biggest bullshit artist. I'm like, yeah, of course we do. Sure, we do that. Oh, can you send me over pricing? So I'd be like running home after the beach show and you know making these spreadsheets of pricing, looking like I was totally together and had it, and trying to get it to them by by Monday because a lot of spa owners actually take Mondays their day off. Um, so and a lot of them, you know, that are that are entrepreneurs too and own their own businesses. They, they're doing a lot of that stuff on Mondays. They're doing a lot of the ordering and looking at new product and things like that. So I, you know, as you know, when you have a hot lead, like staying on it right away is, and following up is the number one important thing. So I'd be just going home and hustling and putting together whatever I promised to people at the beach show <laughs> and getting it up. And um, during that time too, we actually built our first website. So um, we've gone through three websites in 12 years, which actually isn't that many. Like some people update almost every two years, which we've, um, we've done, a, we do a lot of our own updates within. So we don't do full rebuilds often, which yeah, that's another great bootstrapping thing. If you can learn to do the basics with that, that will save you a lot of time, energy, all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, we, we got an online presence during that time. This was in the early 2000s. Uh, started the company in 2004. So this was probably about 2005, 2006, where we were really launching the brand online. And um, as you know, right after that, Twitter took off. And that was a huge part of people discovering us too, as we got on Twitter. And all of a sudden we were getting, making all these great press contacts. It was in the, the early days of Twitter where you could like really get on and you could find someone who writes, um, at Health Magazine and start a conversation with them and actually be like, hey, can I send you some product? This is what I do. And that's that's how we got into Health Magazine. So we've never paid for any PR. We've been in Health Magazine, Wall Street Journal, Women's Health, um, Self Magazine, uh, Edible, um, Organic Spa, all the industry magazines in the, in the spa industry. Um, it's it's pretty it's pretty crazy. It was I'm seeing someone's question right now. It says, "Is Twitter still a good social media outlet for you?" I don't personally spend time on it anymore, but we have a lot of our social media channels that we're doing through, like our Instagram goes straight straight to Twitter and things like that. So um, I do try to get onto Hootsuite every now and then and just check and see if any DMs or questions have come in because sometimes you still do get contacts that way. So it's really um, either staying on top of your own social media channels or having someone else that's monitoring them so you're not missing those leads that do come in. Oh, I can't hear you again, Jessica. Oh, sorry. Um, do, you, do you use um, any of the others, like, like especially the, the image-based 
um, social media sites like Pinterest or Instagram or Snapchat? Do you, are you using yes. any of those? So we have all of those accounts. And I have to say, I hire a lot of college students. And we've gone through different college students. Met, like um, a few years ago, someone was really into Pinterest and did a ton of boards, like recommending different gifts and things like that. She's since moved on to someplace else. And so our Pinterest isn't quite as active as it used to be. But now we have two of our uh, team members are really into Snapchat. I have no, I don't even know about, I just know they, there's like these crazy filters. <laughs> I don't know anything about Snapchat. I've never been on our account. Hopefully it's appropriate, which also I don't recommend you could be checking them, but that's been on my list to do is learn how to use Snapchat. I love that. Well, I was just watching a, an interview with uh, Reese Witherspoon, uh -huh. an actress. And Reese has a new company called Draper James, which is, um, mm -hmm. it's uh, mostly clothing. apparel and accessories, clothing, yeah. clothing but based yeah. on like the Southern lifestyle. And um, apparently she uses Snapchat all the time to drive sales for her company. And so I thought that was awesome. interesting because I've never even used it. I, I don't think I've ever even downloaded the app, but, um, but it's really working for her for a product-based company. So yeah, your daughter must use it though, right? Daughter, she does, yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of younger generations are using that a lot. So, yes. who's your demographic? I mean, how would you define your demographic? What is, what is their age range? And um, because that, well, that so for the great brand, our demographic, our demographic is, um, is um, mostly professional women and men. So we're looking at we're looking at mid twenties to late fifties that are looking for a natural anti aging ingredient based product they don't want you know these aren't the people that are running to, and getting botox done and stuff like that they're they're looking for something that's going to let them age gracefully and um, hopefully prevent things from happening so we do get some younger customers as well but then also i was going to say we kind of have a micro demographic as well with we have a retail store in downtown santa barbara and we do a thing um that we call our custom apothecary scent bar where we have over a hundred different essential oils and fragrances and we have all of our base products unscented so our body lotion our hand and body wash massage oil shampoo conditioner and you can come in and you can custom blend your own scented product and then you can name it too and i actually i have an example <laughs> so this is a room and body mist that's um luscious lavender so you can make your you can make your own custom products and for this and essential oils i'd say the demographic is um it's like high school and college kids honestly we get so many college kids coming in for essential oils and diffusing and making their own products it's crazy and then we have a whole um we do parties as well where we'll do bachelorette parties that you can come make your own soy candles and massage oils and stuff like that and little girl birthday parties to make your own lip balms and things like that so we have you know that's that's another great thing to bootstrapping. Don't put your eggs all in one basket. We have so many different revenue streams that that's how we made it through the tough times is sometimes, you know, if our wholesale business wasn't going as well, we had the parties that we were doing both on site and in the store. If, um, you know, online sales weren't strong, we had, we had retail sales from people coming in from Santa Barbara being a vacation destination. And just in the past few years, it's become a cruise ship destination as well. So this time of year, we get a lot of people that are doing the um, California coast to Mexico. It's just like a four to five day cruise and they come spend a night in Santa Barbara. And we are, we're not right on state street, which is the main street. Um, we're right off the state, which is another bootstrapping little technique because my rent is, uh, gosh, about seven or eight dollars less per square foot than what it would be if I was a half a block further down on State Street. So, <laughs> um, you know, lots of lots of different things. It's it's uh, it's pretty amazing when you start looking at it, like the places that you can. If you really want to make something work, there's always someplace else to, to figure out where you can either save money or grab money from or something like that really really being in touch with all the aspects of your business oh thanks. i love the idea uh, of 
I love the idea of having more than one revenue stream. I think that is so smart. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and I think the key is, because I know that like in Albuquerque, for example, retail stores like brick and mortar stores have a hard time mm -hmm. because they don't have the same amount of foot traffic that a place like Santa Barbara might. Um, so, you know, I, it probably depends on your geographic location as well as to whether or not that would be yeah. a successful yeah. revenue model. Um, Most I don't definitely. Know if you and I have to say, Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara. <laughs> you think we get a ton of retail customers, but we don't. People are shopping, you know, people that live here, they're shopping like you and I do. They're shopping off of Amazon Prime and things like that for convenience. So we do have a local cult following, which is pretty awesome because they love the experience of coming into the store. And we've really developed that great food culture where people love our staff and come in to work with them and see them and see what we're working on and, you know, what big order we're working on. And, Right now we're in the middle yeah. of an enormous TJ Maxx order. It's like there's like 15 extra people at the store right now. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> That's another reason I'm I'm here at home. Today. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, there, we do get the customers that come in for that, but also we are one of only two local handmade businesses that still has a retail presence downtown in Santa Barbara. It used to be all cool local businesses and it's all turned into chains and other things because no one can afford the rent. I mean, even like we had a Panera Bread right on the corner of state. I'm right by the mall, Paseo Nuevo, which is the big outdoor mall. I'm right across from Macy's and we, um, they couldn't even make it. They went out of business. Uh, True Religion Jeans went out of business there. Um, Michael Stars went out of business there. All these like bigger names can't make it he here anymore. The rents have gotten just, you know, atrocious. And it's, it's hard when you're, when you're trying to focus just on retail. If I was, if I look at just my revenue stream from retail, we wouldn't make it staying there either with what we have to pay in rent and support, you know, support the business overall. So, you ha you almost have to have other revenue streams if you're gonna if you're gonna be in retail. I think. Can you guys actually hear me now? Yes. Woohoo! I invited myself and I'm on my app. Oh great! <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just reading another question here. Yeah. And um, just for the rest of the, the folks on the Hangout, um, if you have your audio um, up, then it's creating some feedback uh, when Kristen is talking. So when you're not asking something, if you want to mute yourself and then you can unmute when you want to ask something, it may cut back on the feedback that everyone may be hearing. Oh, I can't hear Jessica. Oh, that's because I muted her. <laughs> she keeps muting me. Stop doing that. No, it's, um, so, yeah, she's got the control panel. She's drunk with power. <laughs> um, but if you guys, to mute yourselves, go to the top of the video screen, like above Kristen's head, and run your cursor, and you'll see um, there's like a little control bar up there. Um, and you can, can you guys hear me? I feel like mm -hmm. I'm having a lag. Um, okay. So Kristen, uh, one question that I had for you about, um, additional revenue streams, how much of your business is, um, direct sales retail, like online, uh, or in person versus wholesale? And which do you think is the, it, what, what's the more profitable part of your business? Definitely the wholesale business. It's about, um, gosh, this year, the breakdown is going to work out to about 70, 30, I think. With wow. Wholesale versus retail. So Incredible. That is really interesting. So we've, um, we've really grown our distribution. We're trying to, we're really trying to become more of a global brand and sell outside the United States as well as getting into larger chains within the United States. So um, that's, that's where the money is in a product-based business. That's bottom line. Either that or have a really amazing direct sale program where you don't have to sell the volume to make the money. Right. And when you say direct sales, do you mean like the um, Stella and Dot model? The yes, like Stella and Dot model or even um, 
honestly, <laughs> what, what Angela has done with Saver and developing a spa where she has the clientele using her product and she's also manufacturing product as well. So there's her direct, direct sales channel is everyone that comes into her spa is using her product when she goes out. So yeah, any, there's, I think there's a few different types of direct sales models, but it's, um, it's definitely, if you don't want to do the volume, that's how you, that's how you're going to make money with product. It's, it's tough though. It's tough when you're getting started because you have to have the inventory. You have to have the stuff to sell. So you have to, you have, to have the inventory to get going. I actually have a question for you. Um, in, we're in a very different line of business in my other company. Um, in that we are building a platform where you can log in and build mobile apps if you're part of a city or you're part of a nonprofit. Um, but at this point, everything is very high touch where we're having to train people before they can um, get an account. Um, and so all of the sales are high touch, but the goal is to become something like the WordPress of um, civic mobile apps where people can create accounts, um, make purchases, mm -hmm. and then begin starting on their own. And so when I think about you creating this online um, world uh, where people could go and purchase things, was there a point at which um, you saw things shift where people began purchasing without any convincing, um, without any interaction from you at all? And what do you think mm -hmm. made that happen? Um, I think a big part of it was blogging along the way. So I blogged, we had our own blog that was linked right up to the website. And I also guest blogged on uh, like beauty specialist sites and things like that. Um, and then also with another bath and body company owner, we started um, a website called Personal Care Truth that was science-based. It was where you could go to get answers about whether ingredients were safe in products or not. Um, there's there's a lot of things out there, but a lot of them are opinion and very skewed. So we actually went out and we just emailed the people that we actually read the blogs to and said, hey, hey, you are the expert in the industry. Can we share this blog you wrote on our blog? And we ended up having six different experts that were also um, contributing. And that built my... It's, it's funny when I think about it, it's like one of the books that I read early on was um, The 4-Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss, and he talks a lot about how you can, you can make yourself your own superstar, and I really, I really did that media-wise between like 2007 to 2010. Um, I ended up, um, within a year of starting Personal Care Truth, um, the, the, uh, national cosmetic conference that um, it's actually international they they sent me to Barcelona to speak on a panel about how I was I was sourcing a local ingredient and created a whole product line with with a cult following so it's you can you can develop if you work hard enough at it you um, I put a lot of time and energy into it during those years I don't put that as much time and energy into it anymore but it was really getting myself known in the field and getting myself known where, um, you know, in, in sources that were respected during that time, the wall street journal wrote about us and, um, you know, had a full color photo of our product. That's, that's instant sales right there. People see your product in the wall street journal. They go to greatseco.com and they're like, Oh, 18 bucks. Yeah. I'll buy that face cream. You know, <laughs> I'm going to try. <laughs> so, um, and not to say that press always brings you instant sales, but it brings you brand awareness. And it brings, um, we're in such a visual world right now that if people see your image and you have good branding and you have something that sticks in their mind, they're, they're going to remember that and be like, oh, I saw that. Or, oh, I read about her story. That's really cool. Something that they resonate with because we have so many options as consumers. We have so many ways to shop. There's got to be something that makes you different. Yeah. I think there was a question from Kathleen. Um, Kathleen, are you, are you, where you can, um, are you able to use your microphone? There she is. Can you? Uh, I don't think we can hear her. Should I read it? Okay. Well, oh, Kathleen, yeah, try again. 
<laughs> no. <laughs> we'll oh, read yeah. it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yes. So I think her question was, um, how do you maintain quality control as you expand your staff? That's an awesome, awesome, awesome question. I am. Um, and I actually, I've hired very few business consultants along the way, but I did hire someone to help me with this. Huh? We developed standard operating procedures. So um, for every single formula we make, there is a recipe, if you will, that has um, not just the measurement amount, like say it was four cups, but it has the weight amount and everything's being weighed on a scale. A lot of this has to do with good manufacturing practices that are part, that's set out by the FDA. So it's following, you know, depending on your field um, and what are what's required, we're following the, G, it's called the GMP, the GMP for the FDA. And um, with that, we've developed a, basically a binder that, everyone that comes in within the first two weeks learns how to use and learns how to go for the resources. And part of when I'm, um, even in our job description, it doesn't matter what it is. <laughs> it says, are you good at reading and following written directions? Because that's a really, really big part of, um, of making sure that the quality control is consistent. I've come up with checklist systems too for the formulas. So like as you're adding this, we have little wipe off. It's almost like a, um, we laminate a lot of stuff and use expo markers and, and little things like that. I take a lot of my teaching aspects and bring them into the, the production side of things. Um, but setting something forward that really shows you, you know, this is how it has to be, even though we're handmade, we have to have consistency and we have to still um, obviously be up to up to code with the good manufacturing practices. So um, that takes a lot too, because when we launch new formulas, that whole book needs to be updated. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of staying on top of it. And um, I had um, an awesome, awesome manager along the way that really helped me. The two of us developed that together and it took us, took us probably about a year and a half to do quite honestly, to get it to where we were both really comfortable with it. And we're still rewriting stuff for it now. So <laughs> it's yeah. a constant, constant process. That's a great Any, question. Yeah. Very good question. Okay. So um, I think there was some other, yeah, there was, I know that Kelly had a question and I, I was just going to ask one follow-up question to what you were just saying. Um, when did you know that it was time to hire your first employee? <laughs> um, when I got orders that my, my ex-husband, friends, and family members, and I could no longer make happen <laughs> when that was, when that was coming consistently, I think, gosh, I think it was, uh, it was when we got our first, I'm going to say what I, what I'll call a big order. I think it was like almost $20,000 a 19 or $20,000 order was when I hired our first employee. And um, she, yeah, she was actually, um, she worked for us for a little over two years and she was my best friend from growing up little sister who just happened to have moved out to Santa Barbara and was looking for something. So it was very easy, but there are also problems with hiring friends. I, that's another thing as you become a boss. Um, yeah. So yeah, that, that's a whole nother channel. I don't know if anyone wants me to go down there, but I, it's, it's very important that you, if you do, you have clear guidelines and, um, that's another thing with the standard operating procedures. We also developed an employee handbook at that time, which is crucial in a growing business and bringing on more and more employees. You must have guidelines that you can go back to and say, this is how things work. Cause then it's, it takes the emotion out of it. It's not about us being friends because we, we work very closely together and that happens in entrepreneurial communities really easily. It's about, these are the rules. This is, you know, this is what the business needs to survive and being able to have that in place and go back to it. I think getting, getting that in place with your standard operating procedures, if you're going to bring on people other than yourself and um, your immediate team, or, you know, if you have a partner, even with a partner, having, having really clear outlined things can just save you a lot of hassle in the long run. <laughs> Definitely. Kelly, do you want to type your question into the chat? I saw that you typed it, but it seemed like it came up in a bubble or something. It wasn't in the chat because I know you had a, um, there you go. 
So she wants to know how do you set your prices? Um, That's Kelly, another are you able, I, am, I, am um, I actually have developed a whole um, spreadsheet to calculate that looks at raw ingredients, all the components, everything that goes into it, puts in a percentage labor cost. So literally when I develop new products, I'm just punching the numbers into the spreadsheet and it's telling me what I should set the price at. Then I look at, okay, what are comparable products in the market going for? The beauty industry has an enormous markup, much more than clothing, much more than food. So we're very, very fortunate there, um, which is how if you look at our products and our pricing, our pricing is really reasonable for the quality price, uh, qual excuse me, quality product that you're getting. So, um, yeah, I think that's where a lot of uh, product-based businesses really die is yeah. is setting their setting a price where they're not um making enough profit on it yeah and, and a, sorry lisa i was no, just going to follow up and say um and just for everyone who's listening because we have a variety of experience levels of people who are on this chat um when you're setting those that spreadsheet obviously you're including fixed costs overhead things like that um, so that you make sure that you, you cover your cost of, of running the business. Mm -hmm. What are, are there any things that, um, maybe you initially didn't know you needed to include in that, um, to make sure that your margins were correct? Did you set your prices correctly from the beginning or in, put in another way, um, what warning or cap, you know, um, caution would you give someone who's just starting a product-based business to make sure that they, um, don't leave out while they're setting their prices? Um, yeah, I think you do need to, like, along with, with warehouse storage and labor and having percentages for that, you need to have some sort of column for professional needs, like your accountant, your lawyer, your, there's lots of different things that you're paying towards that are quite expensive. So figuring out some percentage that you're going to, you know, include in the price of every product. And I'd say you have to have for a product based business, you at least have to have a three times markup. If you're going to, if you're going to try to sell wholesale, if you're selling direct to consumer, that can be different, but at least three times, if not more, three times your cost. That's excellent advice. Um, are you able to hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I think Aaron had a question and Aaron, I don't know if um, you are able to have audio. Um, I, if you can't, then I'll go ahead and ask the question for you. Um, I think she can't, I think she was struggling with it, but the question that she had was, can you describe one of your earliest challenges and how you overcame it? And then the second part of that is how much has your mindset propelled you forward? Hmm. So one of my earliest challenges, and this one, this is another great question, and I've been asked it before, and it's still one of my biggest challenges, I think, that I've overcome in this business. Um, a few years on, into the business, um, a couple on the East Coast discovered me. And you know how I talked about different different revenue streams earlier. Another revenue stream that the Grape Seed Company has is we, we have a private label business. We actually make product for other companies. So this couple on the East Coast discovered me and um, they were both in the field of personal care. They both worked at Johnson & Johnson. One of them was the daughter of um, the CEO of Bath & Body, or of uh, the body shop. Um, so they, you know, they, they had a, deep footing in the personal care industry. I think they saw the concept that I had developed and basically thought, this is amazing, but this is, you know, this is this girl that's a teacher out in California. What does she know about making this big? So they asked me to private label for them and they wanted to go after the same concept of um, the vino therapy, which is using the byproduct of wine in bath and body products and spa treatments. And um, they, they contracted me out and um, put me on a retainer and paid me very well to develop products for them, which I did. Um, I, this, Jessica will like me for saying this. <laughs> Make sure you have a good lawyer, review your contracts. Make sure if you're gonna do anything like that, you, you have really solid, 
legal in place. Um, you know, during that time, I also developed a relationship with them. I was young. I was in my late twenties when we were, we were developing these products. They, um, you know, it was also like, when I look at all the different components that led me to make the decisions that I did during that time that made things, that made things go wrong. Cause obviously, you know, it was a horrible situation, but there were definitely things that I did too that could have prevented it from happening. Uh, basically what happened is they ended up not paying me getting the formulas and dropping me as the manufacturer. So took my, my knowledge basically took the formulas, um, you know, made this whole excuse about how they needed 500 of them each to get to market. We knew at some point I wasn't going to be able to manufacture for them because I, at that time, probably could only do up to like 1,500 units. I think we were still working out of my house at that time. Um, but basically, I made the big, pro big mistake of releasing those formulas to them without just with a payment plan and they just dropped on the payment plan basically. And it cost me a lot of money in lawyers to get a very little bit of money back. And it was a very, uh, very good learning experience. It, it taught me a lot about, you know, how valuable intellectual property is and how easy it is to take advantage of someone that's relatively naive about it. But I was relatively naive and that changed things quickly. So I look at it now as a blessing that it happened because, um, you know, it happened very early on. I probably lost about a hundred thousand dollars in that whole deal, but, um, which, you know, that was tough. <laughs> that was tough too. We had, it was, I think it was 2008. We had just bought a house that was when the market crashed. It was just, it was not a good time financially for, for Ugh. my family. It was hard. Oh it was my hard. God. The bad blessings never come at good times. <laughs> no, it was really hard, but I learned so much through that process. I, you know, I, and, it, and it does only make you stronger and smarter and a better business owner and a better boss and just all sorts of good things can come out of it. Can you follow up on that a little bit? One of the things that um, I know I've had in my own journey is this, uh, I started out, I, I would say, um, very, very naive and wanting to please and um, really with a little bit of rose-colored sunglasses where I believed the best and I believe exactly what people told me. And it's experiences like yours that kind of toughen you up. Um, mm -hmm. And so can you, can you talk a little bit about what, ha what helped shape you as a leader where you could become this tough businesswoman who could make very tough, strong decisions. You could make you didn't look for people's approval when you actually decided a certain direction, and yet you remain um, available and um, approachable, and um, that's a balance. And I think it's a struggle that women have that I would love to have you explore a little bit more. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that's that's there's a, there's a lot to answering that. I think um, I'm just gonna. My dog is sitting right outside. I'm going to let him in because he's going to sit and bark until I do. I'm sorry. Before I answer. We love the dogs. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, gosh. So I think that goes back to networks as well. Um, <laughs> I have some good, close family members first and friends that I go to for the really tough, tough stuff. My sister, um, my sister is one of the heads of HR at Google. So she, gosh, when I have employee problems, she's the first person I pick up the phone and ask, how would you handle this? You know, how, what would you do in this situation? Um, my dad is, my dad's an attorney. If I have legal problems, he's the first person I go to for advice beforehand. Um, I learned to always ask him to through that process because I was in too deep by the time I had gone to him for advice. <laughs> um, you know, so having, building that network and, you know, not everyone has that in their immediate family. I happen to be very fortunate that I do. I'm one of four kids. Um, 
both of my brothers work for uh, very successful startups where they do business development and, and things like that. So I've had a lot of, I've been very fortunate to have, you know, people that I can just pick up the phone and call when I have questions about things and who would be the best person to talk to with this. And, um, you know, I think just staying, thinking about who you can build it like that in your network and remembering that it's always, it's always give and take and, and, you know, just karma of giving, putting it out there and giving, giving what you can to help other people rise up and they're going to go on and do that as well. And there's a fine line where people sometimes overstep that too, which can be a challenge. So <laughs> it's, was, was um, there a, was there a point in your, in your journey as an entrepreneur where all of a sudden you looked at yourself and you realized, wow, I, I'm not the same person I used to be. I am tougher. Um, mm. I don't ask permission anymore. I don't apologize before I give bad news um i make statements um and give directions as an actual leader w was there a moment that you felt that happen or you noticed it or was it just progress over time i think i think um definitely progress over time and definitely in different areas i think one place i probably was was weak well I had a lot of learning to do, let's put it that way, instead of saying I was weak, was um, employee management and how do you manage people out when they're not working and how do you do it in the safest way for you and for the company? Because, you know, conflicts with employees can cause a lot of headache and drama and stuff that you don't, that you don't want. So that was, um, that was definitely an area that like, because I'm aware I'm always working on it, that I really have acknowledged like, wow, I got a lot better with this one. And that diffused the situation so quickly. And the team is working really cohesively because when you're a small team, if you have one squeaky wheel, it can make the entire team fall apart. So it's really, really important that, you know, you keep that going, going well and going strong. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's been many, many moments along the way where I've, I've noticed that, but I think definitely those have come more in the past, like five or six years. Um, for, for the first few years of when we opened the, we opened this first store in 2010 or 2011. And during those first few years of stores being the store being open. And at one point we had two stores that was, I, I just felt like I was doing things wrong every single day. <laughs> there were so many different components of the business that were growing at that time. And I just was like, whoa. And now I really feel like I'm, I'm figuring out what works. I'm looking at the money streams better. I'm looking at what I should spend my time on more. Um, so yeah, I think it's just, it's something that constantly develops. That's a good, that's a good uh, feedback on that. I think that, uh, women struggle with the balance of um, wanting to make sure that they're likable. And, um, you know, we, we've watched even recently that the description of a woman who is tough is very, very different than the description of a man who is tough. Yeah. And so learning how to lead and be tough and, and be tough enough that those names don't bother you yeah. Um, but yet also be coachable enough that if you go over the line and you do become um, very aggressive and you stop listening to the, the feedback of your team that, that you can hear that, that's a really difficult struggle as you're starting to grow. Mm -hmm. um, do the rest of you all have questions? Um, I am thrilled to death to get to talk to Kristen. Um, but if the rest of you guys have questions, use the chat icon that is on your Google Hangout app um, to be able to ask her questions. Um, and then she can answer them because there could be things in your own business. Um, I know that some of you are trying to bootstrap. You're trying to make um, your business work without having to raise money, or you have a business that's really not investable from a VC or angel investors. Um, to those women, Kristen, what, what would you talk about that made it possible how difficult um was it were there times when you thought about getting investment 
Did you explore that? What was it that scared you off? Or was it? Um, yeah, no, there's definitely been times. And um, I think what it comes down to is giving up the control that we have in the company. Like right now, if things don't work, we can make a decision that day to change it. We don't need to go to a board to do that. We don't need to get anyone else's approval. Um, and that's been, I think, instrumental in us being able to grow and accept some of the bigger orders that we have. It's been tough, like to finance some of the bigger orders, um, you know, because sometimes when you're manufacturing your own product, you're looking at almost 90 days from when you start manufacturing the product to when you actually get paid because you might be on what's called a net 60 or net 30. So that means from when you deliver the goods to them to whoever the final consumer is, um, it's, it might be 30 or 60 days till they actually send you a check. So you are funding all the raw ingredients, all the labels, all the labor, everything. You're having to fund that and not seeing any money for a while for it. So you know, there's, um, there's, there's decisions that I've made, like I, we're an S corp. So what, mm -hmm. what I still do sometimes at bigger orders is I might not pay myself. We, we do pay periods every two weeks. I might not pay myself one time out of the month, but then once we get paid for that, that net 30, then I give myself a distribution that's very healthy that, you know, is that plus some. So different ways of managing the money has really helped. Um, it's, there's, it's, it's not, I wish it was a simple answer, but it's not. There's a lot of different, different things that, um, that you can do. I think it's really being creative with your finances and looking at, looking at where you can take money from to make more money and also not growing faster than you can afford to, too. Like literally waiting till you are busting at the seams out of the space that you have to move into a bigger space, those types of things. Um, we're, we're, we're unfortunately there right now. So that's, that's kind of prominent <laughs> in my, uh, my mindset lately, because it's thinking of all the different alternatives and also just not jumping into anything too quickly, really making sure. I mean, I think as entrepreneurs, a lot of times we go on instinct, I still do that, but really before you make those big financial decisions, really weighing out the pluses and minuses and what looking at worst case scenario, like what if this does go really bad? What does this mean? You know? Yeah. yeah. What, you know, how do you uh, deal with the fear? <laughs> um, the fear? That's one of the things, yes, of, yeah. of, of those, there's always this part yeah. of your head at three in the morning when you're oh, yeah. in the middle of a massive decision that that's like, why did I ever think that I could do this? Um, it would be so much easier to go get a job at Taco Bell and just get a paycheck and yeah. um, stop thinking I can change the world. And yet the next morning when you get up, then you realize you still want to do what you were doing. But um, for a lot of the women that we mentor in our um, group, they're at the beginning of that ride. And yeah. so the fear, they don't have, they don't have the successes yet to say, yes, I actually can do this. So I don't know if you can look back to when you very, mm. were the very beginning stages. Um, how did you get over the self doubt to, to really decide, yes, this is, and then even like pressure of family of, of mm. saying, when are you going to make money? Mm -hmm. um, how, how did you deal with the emotion of that? My dad's favorite line, like the first seven years of my business was don't quit your day job. He'd say that to me like every single time I talked to him on the phone. <laughs> you know, they all just thought, oh, this is, this is great. She loves it. You know, she has this passion, whatever, and she'll get tired of it at some point. But I didn't. I, um, I think for me, what I love is I love getting to do what I love. I love developing the product. I love working with the customers. I love, I still get the thrill of like, you know, someone that was on my dream list of, I want to get into that spa. Like we just got into the Biltmore Four Seasons Resort in Montecito, at, which is absolutely gorgeous. And we're going to be making not only seasonal treatments from that for them, but we're going to be like the headlined spa treatment that they have changing up and I'm going to get wow. to develop these every few months for them. So 
that like we're about to they're about to launch with a whole champagne line that we're um doing treatments for that's going out for the holiday season and that still like gives me the goosebumps that you know to do that so it's the thrill of of getting seeing that like oh my gosh this product that i made by hand in my kitchen and that i started making in a boat that was the size like half the you know the kitchen was like the size of my desk it's it's pretty amazing that you know we can we live in a country where we can do that we can we can like we can take something that we're making or that we love and try to turn it into a business and just like anything else some people succeed some people fail it just i you really have to have passion for it if you're going to bootstrap because um you are going to wake up at 3 a.m i'm not going to sit here and tell you you're not <laughs> you're going to wake up at 3 a.m you're going to be scared out of your mind and you've got to just have have ways of coping with that and being okay with that that um and that doesn't sit sit well with some people too so just being honest with yourself of of if you can if you can handle that if the you know for me it's the flexibility as well the fact that i can i can decide each day how i'm going to spend my day and and you know especially now that i have a seventh month seventh month old son i can stay home with him sometimes and i can you know I really appreciate the fact seeing all my friends that, you know, got the three months and then had to go back to work. I so appreciate the fact that I didn't have a traditional maternity leave. Like I, I really played each day by ear and some days I brought him in and some days my mom told me I was crazy because she's like, he's nine days old. He shouldn't be in the store. What are you doing? You know. <laughs> but, but you have that flexibility. Um, so it's, it's what, what you prioritize for yourself, I think, um, you know, if you're choosing to to try to build a business this way, is it worth it to you? Because um, it is going to take a long time, especially if you had a good job beforehand. It's going to take a long time to replace that salary, so you have to you have to kind of weigh out what's going to what you're comfortable with, and that's going to be different for everyone. Yes, it is. Um, Akami just asked a question, and I don't know that she is able to. Uh, join us. Akami, I'm going to see whether I can to get you where you're able to talk to her, but I don't know that I can. Um, are you able to, are you talking? Okay, she doesn't have audio. Okay, okay. Um, the question that she had was by having several, and just to give you a background on, on Akami, um, she is building an online platform um, for girls that's part of um, Minecraft, uh, part storytelling and then um, mm -hmm. um, part Goldie Blocks where you actually build an engineering toy that is interactive into the storytelling game platform. So um, really big idea. Mm -hmm. uh, but as she has started on this, um, she's come up with some ideas for some other products. And so her question to you is by having several revenue streams, how do you keep from getting sidetracked from the main product? Um. It's all about the numbers. So for me, I have a cutoff as to what type of accounts I will personally work with. Um, and this for, okay, so I'll, I'll talk about how I do it now and then I'll try to think about how I did it as I was building. So it's, it's utilizing my team well. So I have a production manager that runs my kitchen. I have a um, front end manager that runs the interface online and also does all of our shipping and is usually the first person that will greet you when you walk in the store too because he's just super friendly and great and that's you know he's really in his zone there um they each have different responsibilities within the business and i have different responsibilities within the business so I've pretty much figured out, like for me, it makes sense for me to work on the really big, re big wholesale accounts. And also I do a lot of the business development and I do all the creative basically still. So um, for me, it's going back to, to that, even though we might be getting some private label orders in or things like that. Um, you know, it used to be that I ran all the private label, but now my production manager, I can, I can give that to her. She can make everything, you know, as long as we have a base formula for it, she can do some of the, the creation that I used to do. 
Um, so it's it's building a team around you that can can only lift you up. That's you always got to remember that when you bring team members on. Like if you start having conflict with someone, are they? Simple question, are they hurting your business more than they're helping it? And then that makes the decision right there pretty clear and cut and dry. So um, for me, it's been about utilizing my team and looking at where I should be spending my time. What's what's the best use of my time? And that that's from the money and the numbers. That's, that's where I look at to figure that out. Um. You talk about bringing on team members, and I think that one of the things that we all do when we first start is that we are so desperate to have help so we don't feel like we're carrying the whole load, um, mm -hmm. that we don't set up the right agreements to begin, um, mm -hmm. and then there's not clear descriptions of, like you said, of who does what, and especially at first, you're, kind of, you're all over the place. Everybody yeah. does everything. Um, were there lessons learned with you when you got started that you could tell the women if I had to do it over again um, as I was bringing on my first person or um, what I gave away, would I do that again? Um, how did you decide um, what those onboarding would look like, especially when revenue was incredibly low so that there wasn't a lot to pay someone else? Yeah. Um I think, I think just being clear with what you need from that person, whether that's, you know, right off, be clear with it in your own mind before you go out looking for the person, because you need to know what type of person you're looking for. Are you looking for someone that's going to organize your business? Are you looking for someone, you know, figure out, identify what your weaknesses are and what you want taken off your plate and go from there and literally make a list. Like <laughs> just say, oh my gosh, I can't, stand doing QuickBooks entry. I want someone that's going to do that. I want someone that's going to do my filing. I mean, look at my, I need to bring, this is my home <laughs> office. I need to bring one of my team members out here just to do filing for me right now. Cause I can't, I'm horrible <laughs> with filing. No one can sit on the couch in the office. It's, <laughs> it's, it's identifying those little things like that. So you know what you're looking for. And then of course, looking for someone that's flexible because we are small business owners and we are going to need that flexibility of, oh, this might not be on the list, but I need you to do that. So, you know, you're looking for these core things in the person, but you're also saying like, hey, you know, I am a growing business. We're bringing on all sorts of different things. We need, we need flexibility. We need someone that's okay with flexibility and change and is good at problem solving and, um, and going with the flow too, not being like, oh, this isn't my job. I'm not going to do it because that just doesn't work for, for, teams like ours. We need, we need can do attitudes. And we also need a pretty clear direction of what that person is going to be doing. I'm not going to say I do anything specifically different with our first employee because I got really, really lucky. Um, she, we just, you know, we meshed really well together personality wise. She's still a wonderful friend of mine. Um, yeah, she's, it, there's nothing that I personally go back and do with that situation, but um, definitely certain team members that have come and gone during the, during the years that, it, certain ones that I wouldn't have even hired if I, if I really looked into things. I actually, I'll tell you guys, this, this is a funny story. It's funny and it's not funny. Um, so I actually, without knowing it, hired someone who was drinking on the job every day, making product. In a, she'd bring a red Solo cup in, and we had a warehouse, and um, the bathroom was located outside the warehouse, and you had to walk to it. And she'd just go to her car and fill it up with beer. I thought she was drinking iced tea because the essential oils are so strong, I couldn't smell the alcohol. But there were so many problems that happened in production, like things like that, that and turned out she you know, had alcohol issues, which is also in a whole nother personnel law type issue that you have to make sure you follow certain guidelines with how you dismiss people and that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, definitely learning experiences along the way. But we do things with, you know, you got to remember someone sitting down in an interview, you're not going to see the real person right away. So I'd say also during the interview, we do a three part interview process. One's a traditional interview. One, they come in for two hours and actually work side by side with us. So we can see how that works and if they work with the team. 
And then um, the last one, we have them actually come in the kitchen and help us start making stuff. Before so, they're hired. Yeah, before they're hired. And we're actually going to go to a probationary, like a, a different hiring structure where they'll have a probationary period and then a very small pay raise once they get out of that where they become a real hire. Because it's also expensive when you hire and get rid of people really quickly. There's tons of payroll implications and taxes and all this other stuff that, it, you know, until those problems happen, you, why am I spending all this money on payroll? I sat down with my accountant. He's like, well, you had four employees that didn't work out this year. And that costs you a lot of money when that happens. So, you know, it's high, it's getting the right people in there and coming up with a structure that's going to hopefully weed the wrong ones out. But, but, you know, things, things happen like what happened with, with, the, the person that we had hired that had the drinking issue. It's, it's not always clear. And people that have issues like that are usually really good at hiding them too. So, um, <laughs> you know, just yeah. you never know. Yeah, everything's learning experience, but that's, um, it is hard to find good, good solid team members. I, I have found for me what works. I love teaching still. So what works awesome for us is we do hire a lot of college students. And then, you know, if they do well, we continue employment once they've graduated. Um, and also we've been working and taking interns as well, which has been really phenomenal because the, the university actually does the screening process for us and sends us like one person they think is a perfect fit. And they've never been wrong in, wow. in the three years we've been working with them. So that's been pretty awesome. So, yeah. Um, so can I, can I go? Can I go to backwards? So uh, to a topic we were sort of on a little bit earlier, but I, I had a follow up question for you. Unless Lisa, you wanted to no. follow up on that further. No, that's um, good. With respect to um, you, you were talking. You mentioned two things earlier. We're talking about the wholesale relationships mm -hmm. and these exciting opportunities that you're getting. Congratulations, by the way, on getting into the that spa that sounds amazing um and then you also said don't um jump in too quickly which i, I completely agree with especially in a product-based business i've had that experience myself with grace and game mm -hmm. where if you try to jump into a wholesale relationship and you're not actually sure that you're able to produce the goods in the timeline they need it can really hurt your relationship and so um, how did you know you were ready and how did you go about seeking? Cause you're in whole foods as well, right? That's one right. of your other wholesale relationships yeah. is huge. Um, and I, so what, like, I'd love to hear from your experience and then also maybe what advice you would give for somebody who is going to be pursuing, um, wholesale relationships. How, how soon do you feel like you're ready to do that, were, how soon were you ready to do it? It sounds like it kind of just happened. Like when you were at the beach show, you would get these inquiries and you would figure out how to make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on when is it no longer too soon to jump in? And um, how do you go about developing those relationships effectively? Yeah. Successfully? Um, I think if you can come up with an actual plan for how you're going to get to the, the product to them in the time period they need and for us, since we manufacture our own product, we have a lot of control over that. Um, for a lot of apparel companies, you're not manufacturing your own product. So, you know, you're you're going on the trust that the whoever's making it for you has given you as the date they're going to deliver that they actually deliver on. So you have to have strong relationships with your people so that you know, you know, like, okay, I can count on this person to deliver on time. For us, it's... Um, can we actually physically make it on time? And we're in the middle of that right now. We have, uh, let's see, eight, we've close to 20,000 units of product we're supposed to be shipping out on the 18th. I don't know if we're gonna make it. <laughs> so to honestly answer your question, I'm still in that problem solving. Um, for us, it's can we get enough bodies in and do we have enough physical space to manufacture? And, if, and it's knowing, okay, this essential oil set that they ordered 7,000 units of that has four different oils in it. Can we fill it, label it, and assemble it into sets in time? How many people are we going to need to do that? How um, It's knowing your production really well 
And, um, you know, I, we did have enough time when I accepted the order, but we had hiccups that came up. My, um, my bottle distributor actually sold me 25,000 bottles that weren't in the warehouse yet to ship to me. So they got shipped to us a week and a half late. If you don't have the bottles, oh you can't fill the boils and you get behind. So it's, um, you know, we're, we're in a, a catch up right now where we're really the problem solving is, okay, it means people are going to be working nights and weekends. And it's saying, hey, do you have friends that want to come in and help with this and things like that? So I'm still problem solving that kind of stuff because even if you plan really, really well, things can still go wrong because you're not in control of everything even if you try to right. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's partly life, right? Well, yeah. and so the, and the final yeah. question I have is, I think um, it's interesting that you've made the decision to continue to manufacture in-house. Why is that? And, and would there ever come a moment when you might decide to hire a manufacturing facility to do it for you? Yeah, that's an awesome question. And I get asked that when people, when people see the type of volume we're doing and still making by hand. Um, so much of our branding is about that we are a local company. We actually source the raw ingredient locally. We're taking waste, we're taking wine waste off of the winemaker's hands and turning it into product. So a lot of what is developed as far as like a cult following with our brand, they really <laughs> resonate with that. And I think that especially that's like, you know, it used to be the green and organic movement, and now it's really a maker's movement where people really want to buy things that they know the origin of. They know where the components are coming from. They know, um, you know, they know the story behind it. And our customer base, even the ones that find us in a TJ Maxx or a Whole Foods or a place like that, that have it, you know, that don't know our story, our branding is on our bottle enough that hopefully they're they're going and seeing something on our website after that and seeing that we have a little um, less than three minute video that that show on the website that shows you we go out to the vineyards with one of our winemakers that we work with and um, actually get the grapes crush them with them and go from that whole process to drying to making um, a soap. So you see it from start to finish, clips of it within under three minutes. That really resonates That's with people. Brilliant. And the branding is about that handmade process. So giving that up would kind of be going against what our company is about. And I think we'd lose our core followers if we gave that up totally. So, um, you know, it's looking at parts of your business that you can, like what I've started doing, actually, I don't, we don't make everything by hand in house anymore with over a hundred formulas, like our shampoo and conditioner, I now send my formula out, I send my grape seeds out, and I do have them make it in a 55 gallon drum for us and send it. So we're just blending and packaging it. So right. looking at the manufacturing process and ways that you can still keep to the values of your brand and what your company was built on, but also grow. Um, so we, we will always produce in house, but there, you know, there are certain formulas that, that because of the nature of the formula, if it can be produced in a larger batch with, with our raw ingredients and all the stuff that built our brand, we, we can do that and still stay to our core values at the same time. That's such a great answer. I so appreciate that because that's something that we talk about in our program is really, um, you know, understanding what your brand stands for mm -hmm. and what, what resonates with your ideal demographic and making sure that you stay true to your mission and your values as a company. And so that's, that's such an incredible example of a company that's doing it successfully. Um, so does anybody else have questions? We've got some um really interesting I do and very can you hear me yeah good hi yeah. hi April oh good we can hear you too hi oh good you can hear me um I joined a little bit late so I wasn't able to hear your whole story um but I have a question did you ever get an investment either from an angel or an investor that you gave equity of your company to and um my main question is if you did when did you find that you could move from bootstrapping. Um, I'll give you a little bit of backstory about me. I own a children's clothing brand and um, 
that's going great. But about six months ago, my husband and I decided to start another company. <laughs> and it is really good. And it's going way faster than my first, mm -hmm. the, or than my brand. And um, it, um, my main goal from the whole thing was to pull myself out of it. So I don't do a whole lot. Everything is very automated. Um, I own a company called Kids Love Yoga, and um, we send certified yoga instructors to schools to uh, teach our curriculum to the kids. So we created this yeah, curriculum cool. with the professionals and pay a monthly membership for their child to participate in weekly nice. yoga. So I have independent contracted teachers, yoga instructors who teach, um, and I just kind of just manage everything from the back. Mm -hmm. um, to Santa Fe now, and I can do that, but I'm gonna have to, I feel like I'm gonna have to get an investment to go really nationally. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of what I'm, oh, is it worth it to yeah. give away part of my company when I'm doing great right now. And I, but I, and it has a cap because of how many schools are yeah. in my state and yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Yeah. So we have never taken any type of investment or, or money. I actually, um, I started the company on a few thousand dollars of my own savings and reinvested into it over the years and, you know, did, did, um, honestly, we're still bootstrapping in a way We're we're a profitable business. We <laughs> have employees, but we're still, we're still bootstrapping to grow. And I think, you know, it's really identifying when you come to that point, like how many, how many schools within the state can you really handle? Could you handle going out of state if you, if you franchised or something like that? Like, you know, looking at whether it's important to keep it, keep the control of it, or is this a business that is actually meant to give up some of the control in order to grow? Um, it's yeah. it's a tough one. I mean, I, I we're kind of at a point right now, too, where I'm struggling, like, for the first time, I'm actually considering maybe talking to an angel investor because um, we need a bigger warehouse. We need bigger equipment. You know, we're, if we're going to continue manufacturing, we can't do it in the space that we're in right now. We're, we're subletting a secondary warehouse space that that's not going to last forever too, because the lease is up for those people in a while. So, you know, I have some big decisions to make in the next few months and it's, it's tough and it's, it's really hard to identify where that threshold is of where maybe you do need to take money from someone else to make it get to the next point. Um, I think if I ever do, I'm going to have to feel really just, at ease and comfortable with it and okay with it, that means that I'm giving up some of the control. Cause for me, that's always been the, the, oh, but I can make it work still. So I'm just going to do that, you know? <laughs> yeah. For me, it's the travel that yeah. I will need to either hire somebody else to travel for me yeah. and pitch to different states, different public schools in, in different areas. And we've already have a business plan for that, but I just, I have three kids also. Yeah. And so it's not necessarily the money, but it, that would help me travel. Yeah. So. That's an awesome idea too. I love, I love your business. That's so cool. <laughs> it's cool. It's really fun and yeah. it's super rewarding. Yeah. Like, rewarding that you I actually get to see these kids doing something so good and it's just it's really cool it's really cool yeah so yeah all right well <laughs> so sorry I don't have another answer for you on that. <laughs> no but I love that it's an honest answer and it shows that you're still grappling I mean it shows that 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 you never stop problem solving I think that's one of the most important mm -hmm. skill sets as a, as a CEO is being able to problem solve and be super creative in finding solutions that keep you moving forward. Okay. And so, you know, 
that's just the life of a CEO, right? That's, that's never going to change. You're never, there's never going to be a moment where you wake up and say, it's all on autopilot now. That just, yeah. that doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a pipe dream. If you have that, I used to think that like, <laughs> Oh, when I get to this or, Oh, if I'm just paying, getting to the point where I can pay myself this in salary, it's going to be so much easier. Uh-uh. More money. More <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> it definitely does. <laughs> um, any other questions from anyone? I don't know whether anybody is, is writing in questions. It doesn't look like, they are um, at this point. Um, you said something really interesting in what um, in your conversation with April, uh, where you said that um, it depends on whether your business is the kind that you want to keep control, or whether to make it successful, you need to give up control. Um, how have you let go of certain parts of your business? And early on in the interview, you had talked about the fact that you've defined, defined these roles and now there's things that you don't do. Mm -hmm. um, how did you let go of some of those things um, but still keep quality control? Was that a difficult process to, to let go of things you had done from the beginning and mm -hmm. trust that someone else would do it? And what, how much did you let them do it their way? Um, and how much did it have to be done the way you had started it? How did you balance that? That's an awesome question. Um, uh, again, I think I'm still learning with this. For me, I'm going to use the example of actually making the product because I love the formulating and creating process. But once the formulating and creating is done, if I set it up properly, my team should be able to take over the making aspect of it. That was the hardest thing for me to give up because certain formulas are like crazy. If you make one mistake, you lose the whole entire batch. Like soap is a good example. If you make one mistake in soap, you could lose 500 bars of soap. And that's a huge loss as far as potential income. So it took me a while to both train our employees and also just be okay with letting go myself because whether we want to admit it or not, we're all a bit of the control freak if we're you know, if we've run our own business, we've done, we've done every single job in the business. So giving those jobs to someone else can sometimes be a challenging thing to let go of, really. Um, and I think like that what, Lisa, what you were asking about, like how much do you let someone do it their own way? I always show them my way with production. I say, this is how I do it, but certain people can do it a lot faster a different way. So if you find a way that works and it looks like it's, it's, more efficient, share it with the rest of us that make the product so we can try it out too. And it's actually helped streamline our process as far as, you know, time is money. And when you're manufacturing product, if you're finding a, a faster way to do it and then sharing that with team members and setting up assembly lines and things like that. Um, my production manager, her mind just works that way. So it's also finding the right person for the role. She's always looking for a way to do something better and faster and quicker. She actually, she races herself with like, oh, I made, you know, 834 units of this yesterday. I'm going to see if I can make 1200 today. Like she actually still after three years is racing herself to see if she can beat her goal. So it's really like when you do give up those jobs, it's finding the right people to give them up to. And then when you see them succeeding, really pointing that out. Because, um, you know, a lot of times we don't have a ton of extra money to give or bonuses to give, but you wouldn't believe what, like, just acknowledging and saying thank you and I'm super impressed or buying a coffee or lunch or a pizza on Friday or something. Like, little things like that can make such a difference in making someone feel appreciated and, like, you know, that they're, that they're where they need to be and they're in their zone and doing what they need. So, um, it's, but it is hard sometimes to let go and hard to, hard to, I think I've gotten to a point where I actually, I get psyched when someone shows me a better way to do it than I've been doing it. Cause I'm like, Oh, my team is, my team is better than I am at this. They are totally in their zone doing the right thing. I should just back away and <laughs> let them go. <laughs> They're better at it than I am. So that's when I know I've succeeded in something. <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely. So. Yeah, I think um, 
I think for me, it was a shock the first time someone on my team said, no, that's not your job. You can't do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and yet it was, there was this relief. And yet there was also this feeling of, wait a minute, this is, what are you doing telling me I can't do it? Um, and, and then I had to back off and think, no, I have a team. This yeah. isn't just me. I'm not a solopreneur anymore. Yeah. Um, I can't run over them and then expect them to still own what it is I ask them to do or what their role is. Right. And so it's been a it's been an interesting challenge. I, I love your answer about how you have balanced those two things. Um, that's really exciting. Um, one of the one of the questions I have, uh, I think that a lot of the women we've spent um, when they start out, uh, we have them do uh, um, this deep dive into every part of their company. And it's like tearing everything apart and taking everything out of your suitcase. Um, to see what you forgot to pack. Um, but there's something about taking it out and then realizing that maybe you packed the wrong things and that you really didn't have this all figured out, that there's this point where it's like, oh, wait, I wasn't prepared to do this. Um, this looks overwhelming now to figure out what I need to put back in the suitcase to be able to move forward. And so the, then there's that point where then we have them build a roadmap of what it's going to look like for the next year and then the milestones that would have to be there, and then the little pieces in between that are gonna get them to that milestone. And then as they hit a milestone, we have them reassess and say, are the other milestones still the same? So when you think about the way you started, some of it really is about where an opportunity just opens up, but it's also about not being random. Um, and opportunities come at you that you can get desperate and think somebody wants to work with me. And yet it's not on your roadmap. And so you can really get distracted if you say yes to things that don't move you forward. Mm -hmm. So you start out that way, but now you're where you are. And it's like you said, now you're looking at needing a bigger warehouse and you're needing a bigger place to manufacture. How does the roadmap change for you at this point um, when you start looking at scale? Um, who gets to say what's in that roadmap? Um, how does that work? Well, I think, um, you know, we look, we look right away for what the team thinks about the situation and how can you continue to work? Do you think we can continue to work effectively in this space? For example, when I took on this, this order like five weeks ago, I sat down with my two managers and I said, look, this is what I'm accepting. These are the dates I'm accepting as the dates we have to ship by. And they can cancel if you don't ship by the date and then you're stuck with all this inventory. So, you know, you really, really want to deliver on time. <laughs> yeah. um, and I said, do you think we can do it? And they said, we think we can do it. We think we can manufacture it, but we can't have it in this space. We've got to be shipping the order from somewhere else, which is where I went out and I found someone to sublet warehouse space from. So we actually are subletting warehouse space less than 10 minutes from, from our production facility. And every two days we are filling up my SUV and taking it over <laughs> with all the boxes and packing the pallets over at the other facility and they're going to be picked up over there. So my team said to me, as long as you get the finished product out, this space will work for us. If you, if we try to store it here on the shelves, under tables, things like that, we're going to not be able to manufacture because we're going to be tripping over each other. So, um, you know, really, really looking at first, if you have a team, what your team says and what they think they can do and listening and then trying to problem solve from there. So, um, you know, I wasn't, wasn't going to go out and sign a lease right away just so we could do this order. Um, but I found a really found great, a really great solution. Great. So that's, yeah. that's yeah. getting us through this yeah. and then we're going to we're gonna continue gonna to solve the problem after. Solve the problem after. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, um, Go ahead. Um, what, I, yeah, so I was just going to say, first of all, I just want to thank you so much for this. This has yes. been absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, you were the perfect person to be our first yeah. for these, yeah. these new hangouts, these new fireside chats. So <laughs> thank you so much for being here and giving well, so much of your time to everybody today. I hope everybody's been taking notes because I, I know every single one of you listening could have taken something away from what Kristen said today um, and thank currently struggling with in your businesses. So um, 
but I, so I guess I wanted to ask you, and Lisa may have a few more follow-ups, but um, if you could give someone who's, you know, um, starting out some advice on, um, you know, how to, how to be successful, especially as a woman CEO and maybe even as a mompreneur, um, do you have like one or two pieces of advice that you think are really critical that you wish someone had told you when you were first starting? She laughed. Um, <laughs> she laughed. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> Well, I'm going to, the first well, one, I'm going to say something that might sound a little contradictory at first, but um, I think it's really important. And this is kind of Can you turn your volume down, Kristen? Can you turn your volume down? Okay. Um, so I think you need to both take things one day at a time and have a good general overview of your plan. So have a year plan, have a three year out plan, have a five year out plan. Doesn't mean that's exactly what's going to happen, but at least have goals that you're working towards um, that, that are very clear and then then take it one day at a time because you're not going to be able to do it all in one day but you're going to chip away at it every day and what i try to do is i look at at least right now it used to be three things before i had my son now it's two things that i look at that i'm going to accomplish every day like these are the top two things that need to be accomplished and usually they are the money makers so I know I'm going to be continuing to bring in a cash flow so I can keep my business alive and thriving. And, you know, I, I still handle all our, all our big account deals, which when I look at our wholesale business, those, those are like the bread and butter of what makes things go. Those are what pay the rent, no matter what the other components of the business are doing. So, um, you know, I need to make sure that even though I stopped and, had a baby and I have a, <laughs> you know, my life's changed a lot and I'm not there as much as I used to. I need to make sure um, the choices that I'm making on a day-to-day -day basis are going to make the business survive and thrive at the same time. And then um, the other thing, you know, you're going to have wins and you're going to have losses along the way but just try to stay focused on what really matters and what's really important. And a lot of times it's only money and there's ways to go back and make that money someplace else. That's, that is a very important thing you just said. It feels like the money is everything. Yeah. So, so that's a, that's a really big takeaway that I think a lot of entrepreneurs miss is that sometimes it is only money and um, it's not opportunity and you have to know the difference. Yeah. Um, I have one last question. Um, well, I have two, but the first one is when you started out and you were bootstrapping and it was um, just you, how many hours a day were you committing to this? Um, and how did that change? And then how do you manage the fire hose so mm -hmm. that you still have a life now? That's a great question and definitely, definitely something I've struggled with over the many years of the business. At first, when I first started it and was working full time, I would work my normal teaching job all day, come home and just plug away at my business. And I, I was going through some things in my regular job, there were like three court cases at that time that I was having to be involved in. And they had actually moved me to a school to deal with these cases because I was the only one that had had a degree that they felt would, would hold up in court <laughs> with these special ed cases. <laughs> so it was really emotionally draining for me. So I think I was so motivated by like, oh my gosh, I want to get out of this. I do not want to be doing this the rest of my life that I would be able to work a full full regular job then come home and work into the night on my business and I didn't have kids then I like totally you know I was gung-ho poured tons I I can't give you an actual hour count of what I poured in but it was it was basically like I had two full-time jobs um, which I'm sure a lot of a lot of people can relate with for getting their businesses going because it's it's hard when you're doing it without any type of investment um, as, you know, as the years went on and I stopped teaching or I cut back on teaching, I didn't, 
I wasn't waking up in the middle of the night to do work, <laughs> right? <laughs> or get things done or figure out, you know, plan out. Sometimes I get up in the middle of the night, this is going to sound crazy, but to plan out like how I was actually going to be able to attack the day and get everything done the next day. And I would just be able to sleep okay if I got the plan down on paper. Like, okay, I'm going to get this stuff done in the morning, this stuff done in the afternoon, boom. That that really makes makes it all work. But I needed to have that plan in order to sleep easy. So it's changed along the way. Right now, you know, I... I can pretty much go anywhere with my laptop and my business is going to run great, but that's because I have the right people in place to make that happen. Um, and that's kind of what I had been working towards for a really long time. And I'd say probably it wasn't until probably about four years ago that that was a reality. So eight, I've been in business 12 years. So eight years of business where, you know, that it took to get to that point, but that's, that's just me and how I, how I grew. But, um, you know, now, now I can just work from my laptop anywhere pretty much, which is pretty, pretty great. And the lifestyle that I was going for and hoping for. So, yeah. Oh, I can't hear you, Lisa. No, we can't hear you. Okay. I don't know if it's frozen or not, but I still can't hear Lisa. Okay. <laughs> 